coming this evening. I just want you all to know that this is what democracy is. It's we, the people, for the people. And it requires people. It requires we all participate. And this country and this government in the United States was set up by a bunch of very wealthy men that were structuring an organization to which, quite frankly, they wanted to benefit from it that organization. That was years ago. Today, we're trying to have a country where everyone can live and thrive in this nation. To do so, we have to put things in balance. And, and that requires change, OK? And the change that's required is that no longer should everything be paid for in this town and in this country solely on the taxpayer. There needs to be a balance between business and community. You all see Amazon trucks and UPS trucks driving down your street more than you do. Yet your excise tax is what's maintaining those roads, not their excise tax. And it's important that we, as a group of People, we the people start to try to bring these things in balance. And this master plan that was written in 2004 for the town of Pembroke did a snapshot of the history of the town. And it did a, a look at the demographics and things that were happening. And it documented it. And it highlighted a few problems that, that needed to get solved. One of which was we needed a new fire station. That was 20 years ago. We identified that problem and didn't have a solution. It took us 20 years to get to delivering on that problem. And that cost us a lot of money. If we had done it 20 years ago, that it would have been the one third the cost. And albeit that we made decisions with that, but reacting to problems is critical for being fiscally responsible. You see commercials every day about keeping your gutters intact so that your foundation doesn't rot and all the siren comes off your house. Because the gutters were cheap in comparison, right? So you take care of those issues when they arise. Problems are actually, for engineering, problems are an opportunity. I'm an engineer. My first boss in my first job said, you identify a problem, you're an educated engineer not spend any more time trying to convince me of the problem. I know you know it's a problem. Come to me with answers and solutions and how to solve that problem. I took that right to work in my first community. I moved into the town of Dunstable. I was 22 years old. I had a daughter and I had a child on the way. I built my home in that town. I bought the property from the developer because he couldn't do it fast enough before my second child was born. So I built my own house. A month after I moved in, the Conservation Commission knocked on my door. They wanted me to get involved in the garden because they saw what I did to protect the wetlands, to protect the natural trout stream in my backyard, to face my house south so that I got solar benefit to warm the home. And I took the driveway there was a plan to go out onto the main road and put it over to the side road so that my kids wouldn't ride a bicycle onto a main road. All simple things that the developer didn't do. So they invited me to be on a conservation commission. First thing I did was say yes and jumped in. A year in, in being a conservation commission, I learned that the planning board didn't have a plan. They had a set of rules for developers to come in town and use those rules to build stuff. And Dunstable was an extremely rural bedroom community, no industry, all farmland. And the farmers were dairy farmers and they were struggling. So they were starting to sell. And so the fathers of the town, the people in the government, fathers and women, women as well, in the government said, we, we need to do something to manage What's going to happen to this town? It's going to explode. And so I wrote the town's master plan. 
I went home and I sat down and I said, how do you create a win-win situation? A situation where, yes, you can allow growth to happen, but you can manage it. And the town can manage it. It doesn't have to be left to a set of rules and have builders decide what the town, the people of the town. And that's what we did. So when the town of when we started buying land, I raised taxes. Everyone got on and up with it. I said, I'm raising taxes so that we can buy land. Trust me, the return on that investment will be far greater than what you're going to pay in taxes. And that's what's happened in the town of Dunstable. They bought the land, they laid out how it would be developed. We created an open space plan, we created a cluster plan. And we were able to take a 90 acre piece and right in my backyard with a natural trout stream and put up 48 houses on 12 acres. And the rest of it was left open space. We created portions of it and we planted trees for harvest to raise revenue for the town. And all I'm saying is that we're gonna do a master plan here in Pembroke. It's not just a historical snapshot, but a way to help us all survive, thrive, and stay in Pembroke and afford to live here. All the rules about towns put all the burden on the taxpayers. The taxes just keep going up. And then the elderly can't afford to stay in their homes, and they lose them, and people profit in the exchange. And that's really not the way I would like to see things happen. And that's why I'm standing before you. So tonight, I want to introduce all the members of the Master Planning Committee. Please raise your hand and stand up. And, and we'll start at this end. Just tell everyone you need. Why are we all for you? My name is Stephanie Boundary. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm on the planning board. I got nominated to do this, this job and I jumped at it. In fact, this is why I wanted to get involved in the government. Um, I was on the safety committee that helped with the police station. And uh, I was the last person to stand up and beg the town to do the town center because we need a home. We need a place where everyone comes and regularly meets to discuss a problem and all possible solutions. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Payne. I am uh, the Deputy Rail Administrator for MassDOT. My specialty is transportation. So if you need to know anything about moving in this town, Gatrip operates in it. And there's a train schedule in Houston and Halifax and Hanson. So if you need that information, please let me know and I'll get it to you. But I moved here four years ago. And I really love this town because it's wide open and I got an acre of land. I didn't have an acre of land in Brainerd. I lived in Brainerd for 35 years. On top for 13, planning for 10. So I have a little experience in this area. Okay, so I'm willing to help the town get this master plan done because it's two of my kids that moved to this town. I have four grandkids. They're going to grow up in this town. I want to make sure they have a nice town to grow up in. That's why I'm doing it. Thank you.
this town and which direction this town wants to go in. So, you know, this is, this is not just a document that they can put on a shelf. It's for everyone to provide their input and, you know, be involved in the culture. So, uh, you know, facilitate or, you know, put it in a direction where everyone
children that have gone through, three of them have already graduated from Pembroke, and I have a daughter that goes to this high school, so. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. I'll keep it short, but if you uh, want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be here. Thank you. So now you've got a cross-section of... Oh, yeah. Sorry. I didn't get, like, kicked out of the tribe right now. I just, <laughs> I just thought it was like, you know, uh, my name is George Gray. Um, I am uh, the delegate from the Recreation Commission. Um, I moved here in 2014. Um, I have two kids. My wife and I have two kids. Um, one that goes over to Hobbamock will be in third grade, and my daughter, who uh, will be in middle school next year. Um, in my day to day life, I'm uh, a uh, superintendent of recreation for a neighboring town. Um, so, uh, I, Parks and Recreation has been my life for about 23 years. Um, I'm heavily invested in uh, promoting the importance of how um, community-based Parks and Recreation um, is important to the overall quality of life for our residents um, of all ages, not just kids, um, not adults, but just of all ages. And that's, uh, in, in my day-to-day uh, -day job, uh, I was heavily involved, while I was most interested in this, this position or serving on the Master Plan Committee, I was heavily involved in writing the open space and recreation uh, plan um, for, my, for the time I worked for. So um, I know how important it is not only to write that plan, but then also work hard to use that as the quantitative and qualitative evidence you need to work with the CPC and other funding sources get things done in town to improve uh, challenge, to solve problems, to improve uh, areas of concern, um, to not let chat problems get kicked, you know, if you can, kicked down the proverbial whole uh, road. So uh, it's important for me to serve on this committee to help, you know, hear what the challenges the community has, uh, and then kind of come up with solutions and strategies to solve those problems, and then really work hard after we put that document and kind of put it all binding neatly together, how do we then take it to the next step and work hard together to kind of um, solve those problems so they don't just sit as a little uh, piece of paper and then we get we get to work to actually solve the problems as, uh, as a community together. Everything you say in this building is welcome. 
we're trying to learn, we want to get to know how you feel about the town of Pembroke. And it's important that all ideas are heard and listened to and accepted and vetted. Okay, because some of the ideas that I do with product development come from the least expected location. I've had difficult technical problems solved by someone who was turning a screwdriver on the assembly line. So in this process, it's really important that people are just able to express themselves. And we hear them, and we vet them, and we measure that, and put it to work. But a master plan is not a document to sit on the shelf <coughs> in Pembroke anymore. A master plan is something that brings us together on a regular basis. It's, a, it's something that brings us together to look at where we're going, how we're getting there. And, and the biggest issue of all, what's going on with the money in our town? Because, you know, tax dollars are your dollar. And, and, and what do they do for the town? It can't just be, uh, you know, maintaining uh, the status quo. We have to figure out ways to maintain a population where people can afford to live here. And we're not replaced by billionaires who want to live within five miles of the ocean. <clears throat> you know, because we have value too. You know, any, any person of any economic status has value in the community. So you're all a vital piece of what happens. So I'm going to turn it over to the HP. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, and thanks uh, to the committee. It's been great getting to know you guys over the past couple months. I uh, also want to give a shout out to uh, Matthew Hines. Uh, with the planning board, he's really been helping to coordinate uh, the whole process. Uh, so we couldn't uh, be doing it without you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so, yeah, I think there was a lot of uh, great wisdom shared just now in terms of what a master plan is and what it's all about. Uh, I don't know how many of you here remember the 2004 master plan being put together. Anybody? And a couple of, maybe two or three folks. Uh, so this is a really uh, incredible moment for the community. Uh, you know, it's been um, almost 20 years since the last time you came together to formulate uh, a comprehensive plan. Uh, so again, it's an important moment. The comprehensive plan is just that, it, it's comprehensive. There's eight chapters. We'll go through what each of them are. Uh, they're not siloed, they're all integrated. Um, but more than any other municipal planning or visioning process that you can do, and there's a whole lot that you can do, the master plan is the one that really brings together the, the, all these different threads uh, that again are so interrelated uh, and that allow you to have a platform to express the goals that you want all in one place. Um, and you know, somebody mentioned Facebook, you ever get that sinking feeling on Facebook that it's just a bunch of ideas that are compiled but not really um, being pulled together? This is kind of the antithesis to that, uh, that everybody gets to still put in their input into the process uh, and, and it, gets, it, it ends up being pulled together into a single document uh, that expresses it with a, with a common voice. Uh, so, yeah, we're PhD. Um, there's six of us on the project team. Three of us are here tonight. Uh, myself and, and Julia and Jenny, my colleagues here. Uh, we do uh, comprehensive plans on a somewhat regular basis in addition to other project types that we do. Uh, but typically we do around, uh, we start around two master plans per year in Massachusetts. Um, and we've done enough that you know we've learned some lessons over the years but the most efficient way to tackle it, because at the end of the day, there's so many moving pieces in a master plan. Uh, there are many themes that get discussed. There are many voices that come to the table. Um, so really our interest uh, is helping to facilitate a process where nothing falls through the cracks. Everybody's voice gets heard. Uh, and the things that, that you come up with, the ideas that you generate, uh, ultimately uh, are reflected in the plan. You know, we help prepare the plan, but to be sure, it's 
we never see this as VHP's plan for Pembroke. This is Pembroke's plan. Uh, it's, it's your plan, really. And, and uh, tonight is the first public meeting, so the key outcome uh, tonight is for all of you to share your ideas with us. Um, so we have a few slides that we can quickly go through to set the table for the conversation. Uh, but again, really, what, what we'd really love to get out of tonight uh, is for you guys to conversationally and through the post-it notes that we've scattered around the room, uh, share your ideas with us at VHP, share your ideas with the, uh, the collaboration committee who you, who, who you just met. Uh, and if you haven't noticed, there are eight tables and each of them uh, are set up to be a station for each of the eight chapters of the master plan, which Julia can run through that list in, in a few slides. Oh, and by the way, Donnie and Nicole and I are <coughs> not here tonight, uh, but they're each subject matter experts. Hopefully you get to meet them at some point too. Donnie uh, is all about uh, sustainability and energy and climate. Nicole, historic preservation. <coughs> and Eileen on the transportation side. Uh, so we're going to do, if, yes. So let me quickly reveal. <laughs> this is a guest network that will allow you to get onto the Wi-Fi and phones, hopefully. Here's the password. Uh, Jenny is going to lead a live poll. Hopefully this works. We'll give it a shot. Uh, a live poll is basically uh, allows you to answer the question your cell phone, and we can look at the results on the computer. Uh, and, the, and the password, if you can't read it, is PPS access. So if you do have a mobile device and you want to participate in this poll, you're very much welcome to. This is just me trying to get a snapshot of who is attending here. Are you a resident? Are you a visitor? Do you own a business in Pembroke? Do you want to know the profile of who's attending?
doing? So while a master plan is not 
things. Uh, and I'll go through the process a little bit more on the next slide. But tonight, uh, the feedback that we get from you on what your hopes are for the community, what your concerns might be, will help to us to develop a vision statement, which is an overarching statement to guide the development of the master plan. So underneath that vision statement, a master plan consists of high-level goals, and then more specific recommendations and objectives for specific projects and strategies that a town can utilize uh, to achieve that vision. So under Massachusetts general law, the eight elements of the master plan are land use, housing, economic development, historic and cultural resources, open space and recreation, public facilities and services, transportation, and then energy and climate. So when we get into the workshop portion of you'll notice that each of the eight stations around the room uh, correlate with these different master plan elements. So we'll have the opportunity to circulate and talk more about what these elements consist of and ideas or questions that you might have about each of them. And so a brief uh, visualization of the process. Like I said, right now we're in step one, which is to identify issues and opportunities and to uh, characterize what the baseline conditions are in the so that consists of stakeholder engagement, um, specific uh, data collection and analysis, and then uh, community engagement. From there, we'll set forth the vision and goals that will guide the master plan. Third is to develop those specific recommendations and objectives. Fourth is to develop an implementation plan. So for each of those specific objectives, we'll outline a timeline, uh, stakeholders that are responsible for implementing those recommendations, uh, potential funding sources, uh, regulatory changes that might be necessary for those to take place. And then finally, we'll hand that off to the town uh, to carry forth the implementation plan. So we'll go quickly through some of our preliminary findings of step one, um, the assessment of baseline conditions. We've just finished going through our stakeholder interview process. Um, so we had a, a great break of across different topic areas relevant to the master plan. Uh, we're very grateful they took the time to, to speak with us. So those different categories, uh, one focused on schools and youth needs for the town. We had one focused towards housing and economic development. Uh, we had a group that we discussed community health and wellness needs. Fourth was environment and sustainability. Fifth was cultural and historic resources. And then the last stakeholder group was transportation. So this gave us a chance to talk with folks that are already doing this work on the municipal side uh, to get a sense for what they felt the issues and opportunities are in those areas. And some of the, uh, just at a high level, emerging themes that we heard from those conversations, uh, we know there's a strong sense of pride for the town's rural character among residents. The town supports a strong network of small businesses. The housing inventory in the town is limited by a few different factors. Um, and potentially some issues with affordability. The population of seniors in the town is increasing as a general share of the population. <coughs> There's a need, uh, like Stefan touched upon briefly, for managing economic growth as well as natural resources, managing those two things together. Um, there's potential to uh, cultivate a greater focus on community spirit and how that connects with recreational assets. So having uh, recreational areas in the town for gathering and for events. Um, there's also potential to expand community knowledge for the town's different historical assets, uh, which Nicole mentioned Ma, our historic preservation planner, has already started to do some research into those sites. Uh, transportation options are limited throughout the town. Uh, and there's potential walkability improvements uh, and <coughs> making, particularly uh, be noted in the town center, so that uh, walking, uh, pedestrian safety, bicycle safety uh, could be improved throughout the town. Um, and then we'll take a look as well at infrastructure needs. So we heard from our stakeholders that there are aging infrastructure networks in the town that need to be updated. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Luke and Mitchell to talk a bit about our findings, how they relate to the different master plan elements. Thanks, Julie. We're running a little behind, so I'm going to move real fast if you guys don't mind so that we can get to the, uh, to the workshop portion. Uh, just a few uh, facts and figures and things that we wanted to point out in terms of what we 
what we saw in our really high level research. So first is growth of population of Pembroke is growing. Um, between 2010 and 2020, a growth rate of 4.5% relatively high for Massachusetts, and that's an additional 800 people that moved into town in over the 10 year period. Um, the age distribution, which has already been mentioned, uh, the share of the population that's under 18 decreasing. You see in blue, Pembroke, you see in orange, Massachusetts, uh, what's happened you know, only four years, from 2017 to 2020. Pembroke, uh, the share of the population that's under 18 decrease 23% to almost 20%, uh, which is almost in line with statewide totals of, of around 20%. Uh, on the opposite end of the age continuum are seniors. Again, blue is Pembroke, orange is Massachusetts. This one is a bit longer of a time span, 10, 2010 to uh, 2020. And kind of an amazing shift over the, a 10 year period where in Pembroke, only around 10% of the population in 2010 was age 65 or over. Uh, and that percentage increased all the way uh, up to over 16% in just a 10 year period. And again, it brought it right back and neck with the statewide um, averages. So huge demographic shifts, which has implications for the economy, for housing, transportation, and everything else. Okay, so I'm gonna go at a very high level for each of the eight chapters. So for land use, which is an incredibly important topic, here is your zone. I think we have copies of this at the land use table. Uh, the, the town is mostly zoned for residential use and some open space. There are some pockets of, uh, res of retail, uh, commercial, institutional throughout the town, relatively scattered. So the question, you're at the land use table, does this make sense? Is there the need for more commercial properties, retail properties, industrial jobs? What's needed? Uh, so again, when you get to that station, please write down your thoughts on some stickies. We, we'd love to hear them. In terms of development that's taking place in town, this is a map showing developments that have, commercial developments of the past 10 years. Uh, that inventory grew 4% over a 10 year period. Um, not extremely rapid growth. In other words, commercial properties are not expanding very rapidly in town. So I'm curious to hear people's thoughts on that. Housing, an incredibly important topic also. As you can see in this chart, blue is Pembroke, orange is Plymouth County, gray is Massachusetts. This is single family detached homes. So in Pembroke, you're very much subscribed to single family detached homes relative to the county or the state where almost 82% of, of the, the residential units in town, single family detached homes versus multifamily at the other side where uh, in Pembroke, there are very few multifamily or multi-unit properties uh, and, and units. So I think that there's a lot to unpack there, um, and, but when, when you get to that station, think about uh, the fact that the uh, senior population is increasing in town. Are their housing needs met? Um, or as households are getting smaller, people are having fewer kids. What does that mean for the, uh, what the sort of housing they need? Uh, this is related to it, housing tenure. This is how many, what percentage is owner occupied? What percentage is renter occupied? In blue in Pembroke, a uh, vast majority of properties are owner occupied. Very few are renter occupied. So, what if there is an increasing number of people in town who, who would desire to rent versus own? Very important question. Um, this might mean that this deflects people who might want to rent for moving into town. So, a lot going on there. This is the median home value in the region. So Pembroke, right in the middle. These dark, these darker colored towns, Duxbury, Hanover, Norwell, very high home prices relatively. Uh, and then Brockton, Rockland, Holbrook, very low home prices. Pembroke is in the middle. Uh, important to note though that home prices are increasing everywhere. So the uh, issues that Stefan and others mentioned about housing affordability, 
are incredibly important, and you should think a lot about that in configuring your master plan in terms of what policy approaches you want to take to housing to, for example, try to mitigate the impact of those increasing housing costs on the population. Okay, so next chapter, economic development. Uh, this, is, this map gives a snapshot of some of the largest employers in Pembroke. Uh, in 2022, there were almost 800 businesses in Pembroke, quite surprising. Uh, many of those are smaller businesses, but there's 800 all told. Uh, and there are almost 7,000 employees working in Pembroke. Um, so here, this bubble shows some of the larger employers, if not surprisingly a lot here on Route 3, but also some in the, in the center of town and a few other pockets. Large, the three largest developers are big box format retailers, Lowe's, Kohl's, Stop Shop. Uh, All together, those employ almost 330 people. Um, so, you know, what, what's the future for businesses in Pembroke? A big question there. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Historic and cultural resources. Uh, there are many. Uh, Pembroke has a very rich historic and, and cultural fabric. Um, so this gives a snapshot of that. I think that station's over here. Very interested to hear your thoughts on how Pembroke can preserve and celebrate uh, its history. Next, open space and recreation, um, which I think is located somewhere over here. Uh, sorry, right here. Um, this is the cover of your open space and recreation plan, which was updated only a year ago. So we're going to lean pretty heavily on that as we're crafting the master plan. Uh, there's, there was a lot of good visioning that went into that project. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, the master plan, it, it, presents an opportunity to integrate all of those other threads into the narrative. So we want to take a bigger picture, holistic view of this. But definitely interested to hear your thoughts tonight on, well, first of all, I think we have another slide. Pembroke, like being rich in history, is very rich in open space. We have 1,650 acres of permanently protected open space uh, and 800 acres of, of other open space. A lot of that is publicly accessible. Uh, and almost all of it plays some function in some ecosystem or multiple ecosystems. Um, so when it comes to protecting those ecosystems, but also allowing residents and visitors to enjoy those uh, those open spaces, um, curious to hear folks' thoughts on that. Public facilities and services. Every town owns and operates, maintains, manages uh, facilities, roads, infrastructure. So here's just a list of some of the major public facilities uh, that you own, including the municipal buildings, town hall, police department, fire department, DPW, the libraries, uh, the schools, like the school we're in right now, and recreational facilities. Uh, each one of these facilities is a different part of its lifespan. So what are the priorities here? What, what facilities need the most love? Which one should be repaired, upgraded, replaced? Um, I know there's a lot going on in town right now with the, uh, the new community center that's being built. So that'll satisfy some needs. What other needs are out there that still need to be addressed? Um, interested to hear your thoughts on that as well. Transportation and mobility. Um, wow, so much going on there. So as a semi-rural community, the roadways are of paramount importance because most people in Pembroke, when they want to go within Pembroke or outside of Pembroke, they drive a vehicle. So what's the condition of the roads? Uh, I know there's a lot of work being done uh, as we speak on some roads going through the town center. Um, so curious to hear any anecdotes, stories, observations that you have for vehicles, but also pedestrians and bicyclists. We've heard from a lot of people that uh, infrastructure for people who are walking or bicycling might be inadequate. So is that the case? Do you agree with that? If, uh, if so, where should we put, uh, introduce infrastructure to support the, the that? If not, why not? What could be done to, uh, you know, to mitigate that? Um, also transit. Uh, Jim mentioned the GATRA uh, services. 
So here, very curious to hear from folks about that service, whether or not it's fulfilling the needs that you have for more regional travel, uh, how could it be improved, uh, anything else that can be done. And then lastly is the energy and climate. This is the, the newer chapter required by the state. Uh, it's in, increasingly important in a lot of people's perspectives, uh, but certainly important in Pembroke. Uh, it's not, Pembroke's not a coastal community, almost, not quite. Uh, however, it's a very wet town, and you have wetlands and ponds and rivers and streams, um, and a, a lot of, so a lot of um, hydrology and a lot, also a lot of floodplains that are, of course, impacted by climate change, as are patterns of animals and wildlife and vegetation. Uh, we want to make sure that any considerations you have and concerns you have are captured uh, in that. And then also energy is kind of introduced, uh, kind of interesting, energy and climate squeeze, one chapter, they are related. Um, so we know that there's solar farms in town. What are you doing about energy? What do you want to do about energy? What's important to focus on energy? So sorry to be speaking so quickly. We want to get to the, the good part, which is where you all are uh, having conversations with us and among yourselves. I think we're going to skip him live poll, as much as we love it, uh, it might take too long. So uh, maybe we can do that at a follow-up workshop. Um, again, I mentioned the master plan website. This is here. You can probably remember that right now. PembrokeMasterPlan.com. So please visit, uh, throw a bookmark on it. Uh, you know, we set it up, if we're launching it today, it has information about the plan how you can stay involved, frequently ask questions, send the link around, please get it out there. This process is gonna go on for another 12 months. Uh, so we wanna be able to make sure that we can collect your input throughout it. And if you have a thought uh, when you're in the shower uh, in two months from now, and before you forget it, uh, jump on the website, uh, there'll be a place for you to share that, that, in, that input and insight. Uh, and again, mention the survey, it's linked on the website. So if you find it on the website, fill out the survey, we'd be very appreciative of that. Uh, and here's some more information on the survey. Again, we look forward to seeing um, what folks have to say. So, uh, again, we're coming up tonight. We have the eight stations. Uh, Julia, Jenny, and I will be milling around. Please grab us if there's something you want to share. Uh, the committee is here as well. Uh, you all see post-it notes on each table. Uh, there's also a big flip pad associated with it. Please write your ideas on post-it notes, stick them to the uh, stick them to the paper, and we'll make sure that every post-it notes that gets stuck on there, we're going to chronicle all of that and write it up in notes that, that uh, get addressed in, in the conference. So, did I miss anything? There's these question starters there. Questions. Oh yes, thank you. And also at each table, there's a set of questions just to jog your imagination and get you thinking about each topic. Might help you figure out what we're trying to get at with each topic a little better. So please read through those and that, and that might uh, inspire some ideas. So we're gonna have a discussion at each table and move from table to table? Sorry? Are we gonna move 